equality and human rights. In the recent years, equalities and human rights have come to occupy a prominent place on the agenda of policymakers, academics, and organizations in the public, private, and the voluntary sectors. This is partly a result of the trend towards mainstreaming equality and opportunity across various domains of public life. The demand for equality has inspired some of the key political struggles of the past two centuries, which in turn reflect the complex and diverse forms social inequality can take. Equality and Human Rights In recent years, equalities and human rights have come to occupy a prominent place on the agenda of policymakers, academics, and organizations in the public, private, and voluntary sectors. This is partly a result of the trend towards mainstreaming equality and opportunity across various domains of public life. The demand for equality has inspired some of the key political struggles of the past two centuries, which in turn reflect the complex and diverse forms social inequality can take. The bid for equality is present in the calls for liberty, equality and fraternity of the French Revolution, in the move to abolish slavery in the United States, in the demand for universal suffrage, in the emergence of feminism as a social movement, and in the struggles and in the struggles against fascism and colonialism. connected equality fraternity connected of the French Revolution. The bid for equality is present in the calls for liberty, equality and fraternity of the French Revolution. In the move to abolish slavery in the United States, in the demand for universal suffrage, in the emergence of feminism as a social movement, and in struggles against fascism and colonialism. Literature offers competing accounts of the different types or dimensions of equality, which include political, economic, social, legal, and cultural domains. The idea of equality is more complex than that of human rights. In order to impose some conceptual clarity, the literature typically begins by posing a set of fundamental questions, what Baker terms the family of equality questions, which any theory of equality must answer. Broadly speaking, these questions ask, what kind of equality do we want? Between whom should it exist and how can it be achieved? However, the most important starting point and perhaps most challenging question is, why should we expect equality in the first place? In advanced liberal societies, the idea of equality as a desirable goal has become so naturalized, it seems almost unnecessary to defend it. Yet, there are well-known libertarian arguments that claim social inequality is a necessary price which we have to pay for individual freedom and that any governmental intervention to regulate inequalities is immoral. Why demand equality? Matthew Arnold observed that equality is like the holy grail. To find it, we have to search it and to search for it, we have to believe in it. Typically, this belief is rooted in a rejection of inequality. There are many reasons for wishing to eliminate inequality. Humanitarianism and <coughs> there are many reasons for wishing to eliminate inequality. Humanitarianism and the desire to elevate suffering, segregation or discrimination, leveling excesses of power or communitarianism and the belief in the collective good to be gained from respecting individual needs. The question of 
why equality in society is a desirable thing is the theme that is underlying centuries of political and philosophical debate. Now, we can talk of various types of equality. One way of approaching this complexity is to distinguish between different types of forms of inequality. In response to the second key dilemma of enabling individual agency, this is a means of identifying the conditions that affect people's well-being. White in 2007 identifies five key categories of equality, all of which enter into the demand for equality in modern politics and which therefore serve as a useful reference point for inquiry in this area. The first is legal equality. Some of the most fundamental or basic forms of equality are formalized under legal protections. The parameters of citizenship are formally inscribed in equality of fair treatment, punishment and protection. The second is political equality. This essentially concerns equality in the process of making the law. This has certain practical limits like it requires a minimum level of intellectual development. This has implications for certain groups like children and the severely learning disabled who are not really able to learn, whose participation in processes governing their equality can only be by proxy. The third is social equality. In the most general sense, this requires the absence of domination in everyday social relations. This relates to arguments for a society of equals, where people have a high degree of protection from domination. The fourth is economic equality. This issue has dominated the 20th century theory on equality. It includes a variety of perspectives ranging from meritocracy to communism. The fifth is moral equality. The fifth is moral equality. This type of equality is distinct from the preceding four, all of which are concerned with shaping the design of major social institutions like education in order to compensate for or alter inequalities. On the other hand, moral equality encompasses recognition perspectives that emphasize the equal worth of each person's interests. For example, Dworkin's respect egalitarianism states that there is a duty for institutions and laws to express equal concern and respect, although this does not exclude economic inequalities. An important contribution made by Dworkin is to link this type of respect politics premised on the principle of moral equality with the legitimacy of state authority. A state is legitimate only so long as it maintains a system that is premised on this principle. An important question arises from this. How far does the political community extend? Are there some people who lie outside this? And if so, who are they? An important question arises from this. How far does the political community extend? Are there some people who lie outside this? And if so, how should they be treated or do we live in a global state? An important question arises from this, how far does the political community extend? Are there some people who lie outside this and if so, how should they be treated or do we live in a global state? Equality is an important component of human rights, right from the ancient to the modern times. People are fighting to achieve this in terms of its practical application to each and every situation. In general, equality proposes to bring all the people to one category and apply the principles of law and justice without any distinction whatsoever it may be among the individual. Justice in simple terms may be defined as righteousness, fair and equitable treatment. To achieve absolute justice, scholars have prescribed a number of factors. Based on various factors that are relevant to each society and to fill the gap between unequal and equals from ancient to modern times, 
a number of scholars have advocated various theories to achieve justice. To achieve perfect justice, one needs to bring in other concepts such as those of equality, liberty, morality and ethics. The aim of human rights is to provide such stable conditions to everyone by the states which could help to achieve the rights in a justifiable manner. According to Plato, individually justice is a human virtue that makes a person self-consistent and good. Socially, justice is a social consciousness that makes a society internally harmonious and good. Plato contended that justice is the quality of the soul by virtue of which men set aside the irrational desire to taste every pleasure and to get a selfish Plato contended that justice is the quality of the soul by virtue of which men set aside the irrational desire to taste every pleasure and to get a selfish satisfaction out of every object and accommodate themselves to discharge of a single function for the general benefit. It exists both in the individual and the society. But justice exists on a larger scale and in a more visible form in the society. Individually, justice is a human virtue that makes a man self-consistent and good. Socially, justice is a social consciousness that makes a society internally harmonious and good. Justice is simply the will to fulfill the duties of one station and not to meddle with the duties of another station. And its habitation is therefore in the mind of every citizen who does his duties in his appointed place. In the original principle laid down at the foundation of the state that one man should practice one thing only and that the thing to which his nature was best adopted. True justice according to Plato therefore consists in the principle of non-interference. Justice being the highest value to attain it an individual has to be provided with all the necessary conditions to realize his rights and to discharge his duties to work. It is the original principle laid down at the foundation of the state that one man should practice one thing only and that the thing to which his nature was best adopted. True justice according to Plato therefore consists in the principle of non-interference. Justice being the highest value to attain it an individual has to be provided with all the necessary conditions to realize his rights and to discharge his duties towards society. It again lays emphasis on the actors and the state as well to discharge every single obligation with devotion of duty and respect for other values. It again lays emphasis on the actors and the state as well to discharge every single obligation with devotion of duty and respect for other values. Article 38 requires that the state should make an effort to promote the welfare of the people by securing and protecting as effectively as it may a social order in which justice, social, economic and political shall inform all the institutions of national life. Article 39 clause A says that the state shall secure that the operation of the legal system promotes justice on a basis of equal opportunity and shall in particular provide free legal aid by suitable legislation or schemes or in any other way to ensure that opportunities for securing justice are not denied to any citizen by reason of economic or other disabilities. The social problem presented by the existence of a very large number of citizens who are treated as untouchables has received the special attention of the constitution as article 15 1 prohibits the social problem presented by the existence of a very large number of citizens who are treated as untouchables has received the special attention of the constitution as article 15 prohibits discrimination on the grounds of religion race, caste, sex or place of birth. The state would be entitled to make special provisions for women and children 
and for the advancement of any social and educationally backward classes of citizens or for the scheduled caste or the scheduled tribes. A similar exception is provided to the principle of equality of opportunity prescribed by Article 16 in as much as Article 16 4 allows the state to make provision for the resolution of appointments or pose in favor of any backward class of citizens. A similar exception is provided to the principle of equality of opportunity prescribed by Article 16 1 in as much as Article 16 4 allows the state to make provision for the resolution of appointments or pose in favor of any backward class of citizens which in the opinion of the state is not adequately represented in the services under the state. Justice is the virtue of practices where there are assumed to be competing interests and conflicting claims and where it is supposed that persons will press their rights on each other, that persons are mutually self-interested in certain situations and for certain claims, that persons are mutually self-interested in certain situations and for certain purposes is what gives rise to the question of justice in practices covering those circumstances. Justice is a primitive moral notion in that it arises once the concept of morality is imposed on mutually self-interested agents similarly circumstanced. John Rawls says that the fundamental idea in the concept of justice is fairness. There are two principles of justice according to Rawls. First, each person participating in a practice or affected by it has an equal right to the most extensive liberty compatible with a like liberty for all. The second principle defines what sorts of inequalities are permissible. It specifies how the presumptions laid down by the first principle may be put aside. It should be noted that the second principle holds that an inequality is allowed only if there is reason to believe that the practice with the inequality or resulting in it will work for the advantage of every party engaging in it. Here it is important to stress that every party must gain from the inequality. The principle excludes therefore the justification of inequalities on the grounds that the disadvantages of those in one position are outweighed by the greater advantages of those in another. The true way to maintain a harmonious unity is by according due respect to the true distinctness of the different parts. As said by Rabindranath Tagore, unity in diversity in general means people of different backgrounds based on their socio-economical, political, cultural perspectives have to live like a single family. This means that people of different faiths and characters live in a compatible manner under a single roof governed by a state. The same is applicable to people around the world. The nation states learn to live as one community. This being the main aim of international law to establish a one world concept, it had given birth to human rights. Its aim is to achieve the aspirations of profoundly divided humanity by setting a common standard of norms for all people and all nations. To accomplish the one world concept, mankind has a responsibility to live harmoniously. This will enable us to achieve the basic tenets of life, liberty, equality, dignity and freedom of thought. This will enable us to achieve the basic tenets of life, liberty, equality, dignity and freedom of thought and expression with due care and caution to promote the rights of all people living in different political systems. This will in turn enable us to claim legitimately the protection extended by human rights. It will help further to establish the fundamental goal of the United Nations to resolve innumerable number of problems that are haunting us both nationally as well as internationally. In the Indian context, the concept of Vasudhaiv Kutumbakam advocates the same ideology of living together of mankind 
with values and morals which alone ultimately establish a conflict free society. India is a land of diverse cultures, religions and communities. There is a great diversity in our traditions, in our manners, habits, tastes and customs. Each and every region of our country portrays different customs and traditions. But though we speak different languages, yet we are all Indians. Unity in diversity has been the distinctive feature of our culture. The real strength of our Indian culture lies in basic unity, vigor and ability to contain an amazing diversity within itself. In this country, there are people who belong to opposite schools of thought and who never seem to agree on anything, yet the concepts of one basic culture and one nation have continued. By exploring the concept of unity in diversity as an expression of unity without uniformity and diversity. Unity differs from unity, unity differs from uniformity and diversity. One can resolve many con of the concerns felt by those who are resistant to the spread of one particular cultural hegemony and those who fear that awareness of differences can lead to a greater intolerance. In fact, the interdependence implied by the notion of the oneness of humanity requires a relinquishing of any idea or activity that allows for the suffering of even one person. If we are interdependent, then the suffering of one affects us all. When a person receives an injury to one part of the body, the entire system of that person is affected as the body attempts to heal itself. If the injury is severe, the whole body, not just the affected part, becomes debilated. If the injury is severe, the whole body, not just the affected part, becomes debilitated. The treatment in that situation is multifaceted. Not only is the injured area treated with specific remedies, but the whole body also receives the benefit of nutrients that are provided to assist in the healing. Human beings have not yet learned how to apply this concept of healing to the planet or to human species itself. As long as human beings in any part of the planet are inhibited from developing their individual potential, the entire species will remain handicapped. True unity will be achieved when each individual becomes an active and functioning participant in the whole, performing the skills they possess as constructive and productive contributors to their local, regional and global community. This goal can be accomplished if a balance between the physical and spiritual dimensions of human existence is achieved, enabling productive contributions to human society to be offered as service to the ongoing process and development of the world without fear of exploitation and oppression. As difference in degree of capacity exists amongst human souls, therefore individuals will differ from one another. But in reality, this is a reason for unity, not for discord and enmity. If the flowers of a garden were all of one color, the effect would be monotonous to the eye. But if the colors are variegated, it is most pleasing and wonderful. The difference in adornment, the difference in adornment of color and capacity of reflection among the flowers gives the garden its beauty, its charm. Therefore, the difference in adornment of color and capacity of reflection among the flowers gives the garden its beauty and charm. Therefore, although we are <coughs> therefore, although we are of different individualities, let us all strive like flowers of the same divine garden to live together in harmony. Even though each soul has its own individual perfume and color, all are reflecting the same light, all contributing fragrance to the same breeze which blows through the garden all continuing to grow in complete harmony and accord. 
preservation of cultural diversity far from being perceived as a threat to human survival owing to rivalries and differences needs rather to be respected and fostered by all cultures. Preservation of cultural diversity far from being perceived as a threat to human survival owing to rivalries and differences needs rather to be respected and fostered by all cultures. Our global goal must not be simply tolerance of diversity, but its positive nurturing. Each culture represents an important, perhaps crucial experiment in the unfolding drama of human life on earth. Religious faith cannot and need not be justified by reason, scientific or otherwise. The appeal of religion is to our feelings and emotions. Religious emotion like other emotions and sentiments contains two opposite forces in it. It has the power to unite a large number of ordinary God fearing persons within the fold of a particular religion, but it can also create division and dissension, instigate insane hatred towards followers of different creeds. How to forge human, how to forge unity among <coughs> how to forge unity among different religious groups? What should be the best model of unification? The most recent but the most popular model is the ecological model. Just as preservation of biodiversity is essential for survival and well being of an ecosystem, similarly, religious diversity is a hallmark of a civilized nation and helps to rise above religious dogmas that bitterly divide people. The philosophical foundation of this approach is the belief in the interdependence of different religions. Ethics and Morality Ethics is the philosophical study of morality. The word itself sometimes used to refer the word itself is sometimes used to refer to the set of rules, principles or ways of thinking that guide or claim authority to guide the actions of a particular group. And sometimes it stands for the word itself is sometimes used to refer to the set of rules, principles or ways of thinking that guide or claim authority to guide the actions of a particular group. And sometimes it stands for the systematic study <coughs> and sometimes it stands for the systematic study of reasoning about how we ought to act. The goal of morality is to harmonize conflicting interests in order to resolve in order to resolve the conflicts we require morality. Morality takes conflict of interest as its point of departure and harmony of interest as its goal. Morality is an organizing of interests in order that they may flourish. The denials derive their moral justification from the affirmations for which they make room. The aim of morality is to prevent conflict when it threatens to remove <coughs> the aim of morality is to prevent conflict when it threatens to remove the aim of morality is to prevent conflict when it threatens to remove conflict when it occurs and to advance from negative harmony of non conflict to positive harmony of cooperation it is not merely enough that we live without any conflict amongst ourselves. Morality tries to bring about cooperation amongst people. Morality solves the problems created by conflict. The moralization of life takes place through personal and social organization. In an organism, the part serves the whole. In moral organization, the whole serves the parts or the whole, but only for the sake of the parts. The parts are interests and they are organized so that they the constituent interests may be saved and fulfilled. 
thus the moral becomes a standard for interpersonal and intergroup inter thus the moral becomes a standard for interpersonal and intergroup relationships when interests are organized there emerges an interest of the totality or moral interest whose superiority lies in its being greater than any of its parts greater by the principle of inclusiveness human beings need the other they cannot live in isolation this need is made possible because human beings have the capacity to take the place of the other that is identification though i cannot strictly speaking feel your interests however i can acknowledge them wish them well and allow for them in addition to interests which are already embraced in me by taking your place you could do the same with my interests we could enter into a bargaining game or into a contract the contract presupposes a desire to agree rather than the get the better of the other party the contract presupposes a desire to agree rather than get the better of the other party here both the party should be conscious of the wastefulness of conflict and gains even if they be selfish gains of peace ethics and morality extend to a greater good beyond the scope of human individuals moral decisions are not based solely on the good of a person or persons but to all things big and small an ethical or moral person is one who struggles with her or his decision trying to decide if her actions will have a negative effect on others when we make ethically sound decisions every one and every thing is to gain man would agree that all people are ethical many would agree that all people are ethical many would agree that all people are ethical to a certain extent some of us make more ethical decisions than others but as a whole we all have a certain innate calling to make morally correct decisions if this were not true hurting another person or thing would not cause us to be upset or feel unrest so while there are distinct variations among people throughout the world on what could be considered ethical or moral behavior most of us subscribe to a similar belief that intentionally causing harm is wrong and should be avoided causing harm so while there are distinct variations among people throughout the world on what would be considered ethical or moral behavior most of us subscribe to a similar belief that intentionally causing harm is wrong Sir. so while there are distinct variations among people throughout the world on what would be considered ethical or moral behavior most of us subscribe to the similar belief that intentionally causing harm is wrong and should be avoided causing harm to whom or what and under what circumstances varies distinctly from person to person morality strictly speaking is used to refer to what we would call moral conduct or standards morality is looking at how good or bad our conduct is and our standards about conduct ethics is used to refer to the formal study of those standards or conduct one might say that morality is ethics in morality strictly speaking is used morality strictly speaking is used to refer to what we would call moral conduct or standards morality is looking at how good or bad our conduct is and our standards about conduct ethics is used to refer to the formal study of those standards or conduct one might say in the end that morality is ethics in action thank you